humans are weird. Um, there's a bunch of things that we do that other primates don't or barely do. We, we stand on two feet, uh, we talk, we cooperate, and we reason. I'm not saying that other primates are stupid. They, they do a lot of complex cognitive things. They, uh, they find mates, they avoid dangers, they navigate complex social relationships. But they don't wonder why they do all this. They don't ponder the, the pros and cons of their decisions. They don't seek to justify their choices. We do that all the time. We do that uh, before buying a car. Uh, we do that before choosing a career. We do that before uh, deciding who we should vote for. Why do we do it? Well, the answer seems to be pretty intuitive. If we reason so much, it is so that we can get at better decisions and, and uh, have better beliefs. This is uh, quite a, a common sense, commonsensical view that is shared uh, by most philosophers and psychologists. And indeed, to, to test that view, psychologists have devised uh, problems that have the specificity of only targeting reasoning. To solve these problems, you only need the ability to reason. And I'm going to give you an example now. So I will let you read the problem, and if you like these sort of things, uh, try to solve it. You won't have much time, I'm afraid. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I really, uh, I, should, uh, I should tell you the answer. Um, thanks to reasoning, uh, we can get at the correct answer, which is yes. Um, why yes? Well, um, because it must be the case that Linda is either married or not married. Now, if, um, if Linda is married, uh, then she's looking at John, and John is not married. So we have someone who is married looking at someone who is not married. And the statement is true. Uh, and now if Linda is not married, uh, then we have Paul, who is married, looking at Linda, who is not married. And the statement is also true. So the statement is always true. It's true if Linda is married, and it's true if Linda is not married. And so the answer is yes. So it seems that what we have here is a perfect example of reasoning, uh, because in order to get at the right answer, uh, you need to reason. You can only do it if you have thought of the right way to solve this problem. So there's a little bit of a problem with this, uh, which is that most people get it wrong. Uh, you know, you might be happy to hear this. Um, <laughs> so most people get it wrong. I mean, even people who have you know, way more time than you had. Um, and so most people get it wrong. And the, the standard explanation for this failure in, in psychology is that reasoning is trying to get at the right answer, but is failing due to um, cognitive constraints. Um, we will say that uh, people have limited working memory which is a technical way of, you know, of saying that people are a bit stupid. Um, and so there's, there's a problem with this, uh, with this explanation, which is quite, quite simply that it just doesn't fit at all with what people are doing when they are trying to solve uh, this type of problem. Because when you face this type of problem, I'm going to turn it off because those of you who haven't figured it out will keep thinking about it. Um, <laughs> that I lose half of my audience at this stage usually. Um, so what happens when you face this type of problem is that uh, quickly you have an intuition that we can't tell is the right answer. I, you know, I'm sure most of you have had that intuition. And then you start reasoning. And even if you reason for a while, all you do in the vast majority of the cases is find arguments for this initial intuition. You think, well, we don't know if Linda is married or not. Uh, we don't have enough information. Uh, we need to know what Linda's marital status is. And so, Reasoning is doing the opposite of what it should be doing. Reasoning has what we call a my side bias, or a confirmation bias, which is an overwhelming tendency to find arguments for whatever intuition or belief we already have. Reasoning isn't trying to correct our intuitions, whether they are right or wrong. It is strengthening them, it is comforting them. So I think this calls uh, for us to rethink what the function of reasoning might be. And a suggestion for an alternative function 
uh, was made by Dan Sperber about 15 years ago, and it is that the function of reasoning is to argue. Not to argue in the sense of you know, having a shouting match, but to argue in the sense of exchanging arguments with others, in the sense of producing arguments um, in order to convince others, and of evaluating others' arguments, and then changing our minds if the arguments are good enough. Uh, one thing that is great about this, this view of reasoning is that it explains otherwise rather puzzling uh, traits of reasoning, such as the my side bias. Because if the function of reasoning is to argue, then when you want to produce arguments in order to convince someone, you want to have a my side bias. If you want to convince someone, you don't want to find arguments for their side. You want to find arguments for your side. So the my side bias is not uh, a flaw of reasoning. It's a feature. Now, by contrast, if we look at uh, how we evaluate arguments, then reasoning should not have a my side bias. Because if it did, then we would reject all the arguments that challenge our views. And argumentation would be pointless. So uh, to test this with uh, Emmanuel Trouche, we have done a, a series of experiments in which we gave uh, uh, participants the problem you just saw, and uh, most of them failed. Um, and then uh, we gave them an argument for the right answer, an argument that was coming from another participant, not from us, not from someone in a position of authority. And more than half of the participants immediately recognized the strength of that argument and changed their mind. And that was true even of those who were really, really sure that the wrong answer was correct. Even participants who said that they were as sure as they could possibly be that we can't tell is the right answer, they were more likely than not to change their mind when they saw the argument for the correct answer. So now if we combine these two traits of reasoning, on the one hand, the ability to produce arguments uh, to defend our points of view, and on the other hand, the ability to evaluate others' arguments then we should get good results. Because um, you know, when people exchange arguments, when they argue, when they talk with each other, they should, um, they should be able to produce arguments for their side. And then other people will evaluate these arguments. The bad ones will uh, not work. They won't convince anyone. And the good ones will convince the group. And the best ideas should spread. Uh, with Nicolas Cledier, we did a very simple uh, test of this, of this hypothesis in which we took a classroom of about uh, 30 students and we gave them a problem very similar to the one you saw earlier. And after five minutes of uh, individual reasoning, here is what we got. So here are the two uh, little um, green squares are the two people who, who got the problem right. Um, after five minutes, so it was not just you know, 20 seconds like you had if there were you know, five solid minutes of solitary reasoning, two people got it right. All the red squares are people who got it wrong, and the uh, black squares are just empty seats. And after this uh, solitary reasoning, um, we asked participants to talk with each other and to talk with their neighbors to see if they could change their mind. And uh, in the animation I'm about to show you, uh, you'll see what happened after 20 minutes, or rather during 20 minutes of discussion. So uh, when you're a psychologist, you're quite happy when your experiments work like that. Uh, that doesn't happen every day. Um, so, you know, argumentation works. Um, argumentation doesn't only work in our uh, modern, educated Western cultures. Um, Thomas Castellan spent more than six months in, in uh, remote rural areas of Guatemala uh, working with traditional populations and he found basically the same results. He found that when they were reasoning on their own, uh, they had a strong my side bias, which prevented them from getting at, from getting at the right answers. Uh, but they were able to evaluate others' arguments. And as a result, uh, when they tried to solve problems in groups, uh, they did much better. Um, argumentation also works with children. Um, so those of you who have children will, will know that they start to argue very early on. Uh, you know, they, they try to convince you to give them more cookie, to not go to bed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, recently, our, my uh, three-year-old told us that yeah, he couldn't go to bed because he was too tired. 
Uh, so <laughs> they're not doing it perfectly well, and you know, neither are adults for that matter. But you know, they start very early. As soon as they can string a sentence together, they'll, uh, they'll argue. Uh, but what, you know, what you'll be happy to hear is that young children are also able to evaluate uh, others' arguments. And uh, for instance, in an experiment that, that we did with uh, Fabrice Clément and Stéphane Bernard, we showed that three-year-olds can distinguish, in some cases, um, strong from weak arguments. Uh, argumentation works in the classroom. Hundreds of studies of collaborative or cooperative learning have shown that when you put students together and you ask them to, um, to solve problems, they typically get at a deeper understanding of the concepts involved, uh, much deeper than what they would get from passively listening to their teacher. Argumentation works in science. Uh, many of you might have heard of Max Planck's quip that science progresses funeral by funeral meaning that scientists never change their mind. They have to die before you know, a new generation comes over with new theories. Well, that is just plain rubbish. Um, science progresses extremely quickly, and in most cases, even revolutionary ideas will spread as fast as the evidence uh, allows. And indeed, even Max Planck um, you know, saw you know, all of his ideas, which were truly revolutionary, um, become you know, completely widespread in, in the physics community, uh, long before he died. Um, science, uh, argumentation uh, works in the workplace. Just to give you one example, uh, Barb Mellers, Phil Tetlock, and their colleagues uh, did a large-scale study of how experts make predictions, uh, you know, such as predictions about who is going to wage war with whom, uh, you know, what regime will crumble. And what they found is that experts were able to make much better predictions when they could talk with each other. Uh, they were making better predictions than when they were either reasoning on their own or when they were only seeing what other experts were saying uh, but were not able to talk with them. Argumentations work, uh, argumentation works in the law. Uh, when you ask juries to deliberate, um, you usually get a better verdict than if you just took the uh, opinions of single jurors because during deliberation, the jurors are able to compensate for each other's biases and to, um, to correct each other's mistakes. Argumentation uh, even works in politics. That may be kind of harder to believe. But uh, dozens of experiments in, uh, in deliberative democracy have shown that when you put citizens together and you ask them to discuss policy issues, uh, they do well. They uh, get at better views, they, uh, their views become less extreme, and they understand better people who disagree with them. Argumentation also works in the moral realm. Uh, so I'm not claiming that all moral progress is, you know, can be put down to argumentation, but argumentation is critical to moral progress in most cases. Uh, and then again, just to give one example, uh, when at the, uh, at the turn of the 19th century, the British abolitionists managed to uh, get the slave trade to be abolished uh, in Britain, uh, they did it thanks to argumentation. They did it because they had worked tirelessly to gather and to disseminate arguments. Argumentation works. And before finishing, I will um, show you one last, I will tell you about one last experiment uh, that we did in which we asked people uh, to solve the problem that you had seen earlier and then to indicate how confident they were in their answers. So here is how many people got it right. Uh, the green bit there, that was about 20%. Uh, that was quite a good day. Um, and now here is how many people were really, really sure that they had gotten it right. People who thought they were really, you know, very, very confident. And we get at more than 80%. So the problem here is not only uh, that most people get it wrong. The problem is that most people think they get it right. And solitary reasoning is unlikely to help in these cases. When we have strong intuitions about um, who we should vote for, about what car we should buy, about what career we should pursue, reasoning on our own is not going to tell us whether we're right or wrong. The best way to do this is to find people who disagree with us and to talk to them. The worst thing that can happen is that you know, we'll realize we were wrong. And that's a risk well worth taking. Thank you. <laughs>